You're, you're, you're listening to the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. This is the MD's Fantasy Football Show with Dan Mader. Thank you, the X's and O's of all things fantasy. On the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And welcome back, MD Nation, to the show. As always, I'm your host, Dan Mader. We are listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio radio network presented to you by belly up sports we're talking about the early week eight matchup previews because it's thursday and that's exactly what it is that we talk about every single thursday and friday from 12 to 1 30 on the worldwide sports radio network right here on your favorite android app or wwsrn on ios and of course we have a big week for you we we're past the midway point right now we are in the full-on, full-throttle, we have to make the playoffs. It's contention right here. It's now or never. You are in the last stretch. If you're in first place, you're in great shape. But for those of you who are in third and second, you're trying to make sure you hold on to those last few playoff spots. This is You're really in playoff mode now. You're in win-every-single-week mode now. There's very little room for error because now, all of a sudden, we only have six games left of the regular season for your fantasy football lineups. It is down to the nitty gritty. We are in the heaviest of bye weeks over the next couple of weeks, week eight and nine. And remember this year, we have bye weeks that last all the way up to week 13, unfortunately. Now, I believe week 13, we only have two teams on bye. But still, that is going to screw up a lot of people because that week 13, everybody is kind of relying on that last game to be at full strength, kind of the pre-playoffs to the playoffs. And keep in mind, if you're going to have guys that are actually on by that week it just puts even more emphasis on your week eight matchups this week that's why this show this week is so important for your fantasy football lineups so we're gonna have to dive into that today before we kick off the show and talk about the thursday night game though and we'll be talking about all the injury updates in today's show we'll be talking about where i have guys ranked where i have guys valued at and of course we'll have a mailbag segment for you guys at the end which you can always get into if you just hit us up on social media at Belly Up MDFM Show on Twitter or on Facebook, it matters not either way. We do have this week in COVID. We were this close. We were this close to not having to talk about the team having a player test positive for COVID. So close. And yet, about an hour, I would say, before we came on to the show today, all of a sudden we have the Giants. They had a player test positive. They asked all the players that were close in contact to them to stay home, but the facilities are still open and the same thing goes for the chargers that just came out maybe about 45 minutes ago or so they also had to send a player home along with all their close contacts they're doing all their team meetings by virtual today so we had a couple of things we had to watch we're gonna have to watch the monday night game we're gonna have to watch the chargers game thankfully because of the 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 contact tracing that they have now in place and because of uh, that game, the Giants, uh, Tampa Bay game in particular being Monday night, I feel pretty good that we're not going to run into a postponement, a rescheduling this uh, week. Like I said, with the contact tracing now, they have that kind of established a little bit more. It's easier to just be like, okay, we know that these players were near each other at the time. We can send all of them home before it affects the rest of the team. So we shouldn't have another Tennessee Titan situation on our hands like we had a few weeks ago. That's the good news about that. Of course, we don't want to hear about any positives and what that could put us in limbo when you're trying to decide before the Thursday night game, of course, what you want your lineups to be. It just throws everything off and it throws everything in the question but I do have more hope about how this is going to move forward and what we're going to have to deal with than I would have. It has been really any other week leading up to this point because the contract tracing is starting to be more effective. Uh, so that's the good news there. So now that we have that out of the way, I just want to go ahead and dive right into the Thursday night game because we have a lot of games to talk about in the early window. Remember, that's what we're talking about today's show is the early window matchup of week eight. And we're going to kick it off course with the Thursday night game tonight between the Atlanta Falcons and the Carolina Panthers, an interesting divisional game, a game that which could be a shootout on paper. But the Panthers defense, I think, has surprised some people as of late. They've been playing much better than what people anticipated them to be able to do, especially against the quarterback and the wide receiver positions. 
I still don't buy into that they are a matchup that I have to be afraid of. I don't buy into that I have to be afraid for Julio or I have to be afraid for Calvin or even afraid for Hayden Hurst being a top 12 tight end for us this week. I also don't buy in that I have to be afraid of for Matt Ryan. Kind of talked about this in the past before. Julio Jones is out there playing. It's Carolina, while they've played better than I think anybody expected them to to this point in that secondary, Julio didn't have, wasn't out there the first time that they played the Carolina Panthers. He wasn't. And that makes a huge difference between what Matt Ryan and the Falcons can do and what they cannot do. That's That first game, that was the first game that marked Matt Ryan imploding and all of a sudden being questionable because to that point, the first two weeks, Matt Ryan was a fantasy football superstar and all of a sudden, he loses Julio Jones right before the Carolina game, a game that looked like it was going to be a shootout on paper and he just flat out imploded. Julio has a history of dominating the Carolina Panthers even when they were good on defense. So I expect this to be a high scoring game because on the flip side of that, of course, Teddy Bridgewater is going to have a good game. Of course, Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore, and what's going to be Mike Davis, it looks like in tonight's matchup uh, is are all going to have great games in front of them. Christian McCaffrey, he may be back week nine. I have been saying all along that week nine was just, it was more plausible for the simple fact that you have, uh, this game is going to be on Thursday. They want to give him a full week of practice reps, I believe, before they actually go ahead and send him out there. The good news, if you're a Christian McCaffrey owner, is that if he comes back week nine, which is what we anticipate happening, he will be as close to 100% healthy as he could possibly be coming off of this high ankle injury. I know some people are looking at what happened with Saquon last year and seem to be a little bit afraid of exactly what they're going to get out of Christian McCaffrey when he returns. Remember the difference between Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley of last year. Saquon came back too soon. It was a high ankle sprain. He should have been out four to six weeks. He came back in two. That was the big difference. He rushed back. I Chris McCaffrey didn't rush back. He stayed out the full length of the timeline. They were able to hold down the fort with Mike Davis in his stead. So that was the good news. And that didn't put any extra pressure on him to try to rush back. So I believe Christian McCaffrey will be close to 100%. And I do not buy into this idea that Mike Davis is going to be involved in the offense in such a significant way that people are now going to be worried about, well, is Chris McCaffrey going to truly get his full bell cow workload? Yes. Yes, he is. Will it be 90, 95% of the touches, 90, 95% of the snaps? Probably not, but will it still be 80 to 85? Yeah. Mike Davis isn't going to come in there and all of a sudden create this 60, 40 split. So I don't know what everyone is concerned about, but I'm telling you guys right here, right now, if you're a Chris McCaffrey owner, do not worry about Mike Davis all of a sudden turning this into a Carolina committee. I don't care how well he played. He's actually cooled off over the past couple of weeks. Anyway, Christian McCaffrey is hands down one of the, if not the best running back, best playmaker, best weapon in the NFL. You don't suddenly make Mike Davis, who's only been a thing in until it hasn't been a thing since the Chargers really up until this year, where all of a sudden he looks like he actually got back in the shape for this season. That all of a sudden he's going to be a guy who has to be involved. I don't care how well he played. This team is built around Christian McCaffrey leading them to the playoffs. That is going to continue. So everyone can just kind of relax about that. Okay. Don't worry about it. At worst, at worst, Christian McCaffrey will have 80% of the work, which will still be more than pretty much anybody in the NFL when he comes back and that would be at worst, that would be a worst case scenario. So no worries there. I just want to touch on that kind of getting back into this game though. Teddy Bridgewater comes in as QB three for us this week. Now, Against the Atlanta Falcons, we all know that they can't stop anything. Bridgewater has looked good and solid in every game, I think, except for with the exception of one in that Chicago game was the only game where he didn't really play well. Other than that, he has played very well every single week. You put him in a matchup. He had a good game against the Atlanta Falcons the first time around. And being that the Falcons have Julio Jones this time around, I think their offense will be more effective this time around. I think there's a good chance this, this game will be more of a shootout than we expected to be the first time around. All those things combined together for Teddy Bridgewater, I believe, to at least go over 300 yards and receive 
two touchdowns and, and throw for two touchdowns, I should say, minimum in this game. And being that's a minimum, being that I think that's a floor, he comes in as QB3 for me on the week, making him hands down the number one streaming option because we talked about him on the waiver wire report. This guy is only 30, was only 30% owned, I should say, heading into Tuesday night for all your waiver wire leagues. Now, I haven't checked it since. I assume that the numbers would have gone up since then, considering the matchup and considering how many people are streaming quarterbacks out there right now. I assume he's more than 50% owned. But this is a guy who's consistently been under 50% owned pretty much all season, and yet he's been a very good quarterback who's had a high floor for fantasy football purposes all throughout the year. So I love him this week. He's definitely a top five. I believe he'll be a top three quarterback this particular week. And if he's out there available to you, there's no reason why he should be, especially if you've been streaming at the quarterback position. So I love me some Teddy Bridgewater. DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson. Everyone wants to know, where do you rank these guys at? Not that you're not going to play them. You're going to play more. You're going to play Robbie Anderson. I don't think there's any question about that. And there really shouldn't be, especially when when you give him the matchup. However, people want to know, With DJ Moore only getting about five targets a game over the last three weeks, even though he's been able to perform the last three weeks, he's been able to score touchdowns the last three weeks, he's been able to go for 93 yards the last three weeks, is it something that you can trust? Well, I think it's something that you can trust for this game. DJ Moore comes in as my wide receiver 10 in half-point PPR leagues. Robbie Anderson comes in as my wide receiver 5. I'm telling you, you could play both of them as wide receiver 1. This also goes back to the point of why I have Teddy Bridgewater so high heading into this matchup. With DJ Moore, obviously, I don't love the fact that he's only seeing about five targets average over the past three weeks when he's been able to do his most efficient work so far in the season. And if you're asking me for the rest of the season, how do I view DJ Moore as a result to that? My advice to you has been, and we talked about this on Tuesday and on Monday, to sell high on DJ Moore. Maybe wait till after this game because he should have a very good game in this one and sell high on him. Because I've talked about this a million times. He's not targeting the red zone still. Most of his touchdowns that he's been able to score so far this season have been coming from outside of the 20. They've been on big plays. He's not going to be a red zone threat. He's still a guy that if you want consistent production out of, I believe has to be seeing at least eight to 10 targets a game. That is not happening because Robbie Anderson is getting those targets. Robbie Anderson is getting eight to 10 targets a ball game. That's why Robbie Anderson is probably one of the safest wide receiver, high-end wide receiver twos as they come along with having wide receiver one potential so far this year, given the offense, given his ability and the volume that he is seeing. So Robbie Anderson is a set it and forget it wide receiver starter in your, in your lineups, no matter what. DJ Moore is going to have matchups. He's going to have situations where he's going to have a low floor. I believe right now, after this game tonight, you'll be able to sell him for almost anything you want to, because if he has a month long of good games on his resume and he comes off of a big one against the Atlanta Falcons here, which I believe he will, then he should, you should have no problem being able to move DJ Moore for what you want and avoid those low floor games that will come if he's only continuing to see five targets a game. And that would be my major concern when it comes to DJ Moore. Now, next up, We can move on now to our early window of the Sunday games. And the first one that we want to talk about is the Patriots and the Buffalo Bills. Well, my goodness. What do you do with Cam Newton? I don't know. I have him as QB 21. I don't think there is a single New England Patriot player that you have to play this week. The only other person that even comes in my top 36 is Rex Burkhead. That's it. And that's only because he's seeing both the carries and receiving work enough where he has somewhat of a high floor. But Josh McDaniels, Josh McDaniels doesn't have a leg to stand on. Josh McDaniels should not be considered a primetime head coaching candidate that he has been for the past couple of seasons. Josh McDaniels borderline really should be on the hot seat of whether or not he should even be the offensive coordinator moving forward after this season. The play calling has been horrendous. The play calling has been so predictable, so vanilla. And that's been the number one issue, especially over the past couple of weeks. They look like they had no plan of attack against the San Francisco 49ers. None. And it wasn't just because Cam didn't play well. It is a mixture of they don't have a deep field threat. So there's no reason for a defense to feel the need to have to protect deep. They can just squeeze this offense, play it close to the line of scrimmage because That's where this entire offense is going to be taking place at. They don't have anybody to stretch the field. And Cam Newton, frankly, I don't think has the arm to stretch the field anymore either. 
he hasn't been throwing the ball well. You've been leaning on him for his legs in a fantasy football purpose. Now, will it be better than two points? Yes, it will be better than two points. That doesn't mean you want to play him, though, obviously. And what's crazy about this is that the Bills haven't had the greatest defense this year. Had Cam been playing just decently over the past two weeks after coming off the bye, after coming off of COVID, I think you would be looking to play Cam as a borderline top 12 quarterback this year, uh, this week. But as it stands right now, how can you? There's nothing on this Patriot team that scares you. There's no reason to believe that they have any kind of a ceiling in this matchup. And Cam's the only one who I would even be contemplating. There's no way. There's no way. He is back on the, you. he's going to have to show me before I believe I can play him in my lineup again. And Josh McDaniels is going to have to do something different. And that's what I'm talking about with the running back situation. The only reason that Rex Burkhead, I believe, has been as successful as he has been to this point is because he's the only running back that, when in the game, does not tip the hand as to exactly what the Patriots are going to do. If James White's in the game, they're throwing the football and they're checking it down. If Damian Harris is in the game, they are running the football with either Cam or Damian Harris. If Rex Burkhead's in the game, you're not entirely sure because he's the only running back that they'll either run it with or throw it with. It's making the entire offensive system predictable. We've seen this in the past when guys just have too many running backs that they feel like they have to rotate out there for absolutely no reason at all. So until Josh McDaniels gets his act together, I don't think there's a single Patriot player that you can play moving forward. And the only, like I said, the only one I'm even going to think about is Cam, and he's going to have to show me before I can believe I can put him back in my lineup again at any point this season. We move on to, oh, real quick, though, I want to mention Nikhil Harry. He is in concussion protocol. He's had a head injury. Not that you're going to play him for fantasy lineups anyway, but that is the one injury going on on the Patriots side of the ball. We move on to the Buffalo Bills. Josh Allen didn't get quite right against the Jets like everybody was helping. However, he still comes in as QB6 for us. The Patriots, just as a team, just look like they're kind of in shambles right now. And I know this is a divisional matchup, and I know it's Bill Belichick, and I know a lot of people are saying, like, well, they have a habit of being able to bounce back in these situations. Look, this is not the same talented Patriots team that we've seen over the past couple of years. And I think the big thing is that they don't have Tom Brady. And even when Tom Brady wasn't playing well, he had the team focused. I don't believe right now that that team's buying in. You have trade rumors circling around about Stephon Gilmore possibly being traded by next week's deadline. I think there's a lot of flux within that team. And I don't think they're necessarily in a spot where they know for sure that they're trying to go for it all, that they're trying to win it all. I don't think they, I don't think they know that. I don't think they know that's what their goal is. So I believe that this game, Josh Allen, because the Patriots aren't as bad as the New York Jets are right now, because nobody's as bad as the New York Jets are, should give you a top 10 performance, should give you a top six performance in this game. Remember, the one thing about Allen is that he's always going to be the guy who could get you 15 points just with his legs. So he's always going to have that high floor. You're never going to bench him, and I don't think any people were talking about him doing so. You're just kind of questioning, can I get the ceiling that I was getting through the first four weeks? Of course it's possible, but I don't think it's probable, not even in this game. His fundamentals have fallen off. He's back to Josh Allen of last year. Unless that is able to rework itself, he's going to be back to being his inconsistent, not always making smart decision, Josh Allen self. But that doesn't mean for fantasy football purposes that he still can't finish in the top six because of his legs. So you're, you're going to play him. You're going to expect a high ceiling, especially this week. When you look at the matchups this week, and it will, you'll kind of notice as we go through them, when we go through this show and we go through tomorrow's show, our 12 to one thirty on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network, the late window of week eight matchup previews, you're going to notice that this is not shaping up to be a particularly high scoring week. I would not be surprised that there's a lot of low fantasy scores this week. Wouldn't be surprised at all. That's why I think Josh Allen maybe doesn't have to give you the 35-point performance in order to give you a top-six quarterback performance for the week. There's a real chance we're going to see a lot more low-scoring games heading into a week, or at least a lot more low-scoring fantasy uh, points scored. Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, what do you do? I don't think you play either one of them. I have them both ranked as RB3s coming into the week. You're not going to feel good about either one, even though this is a matchup that is, should be a decent matchup on paper, but so is the Jets. I think ultimately, right now, the tea leaves are telling me that the Buffalo Bills would rather see Zach Moss take over this job than Devin Singletary. 
I think they're looking at this as Devin Singletary had a shot. Zach Moss was out. He was only okay for the most part. He wasn't great. He wasn't good. And look, with the way that they're using the running game, the way they're using Josh Allen, the way they're using this offense in general, I don't believe there's any running back on the Buffalo Bills right now who's actually going to get enough touches to stay in rhythm. Neither one is going to be getting 18 to 20 20 opportunities. It's not going to happen because they're both going to be playing at a near 50-50 split. But would I be surprised before long that it's Zach Moss getting that 55 to 45 split with Devin Singletary across the board between rushing and receiving statistics? No, it wouldn't surprise me at all. There's a reason the Buffalo Bills had interest in trying to sign Le'Veon Bell. Can you drop them? No, you can't drop guys who should still, because of the volume, because of the matchup, be considered somewhere in the RB3 territory. But do you feel good about playing either one? Absolutely not. And I would hope you have better options, but there are pieces that you have to keep in case one gets injured and somebody falls into a situation where just by default they have a lot of touches or maybe one gets hot but you're not going to play him right now this week. This is a wait and see situation only in if you're in desperate buy situations, do they come in as flex plays for you, which is why they come in as RB threes for me, because there's going to be a lot of those situations out there this week, given injuries and given the heavy bye week. Stefan Diggs, we expect him to be okay. As far as the little bit of injury that he picked up last week, he comes in at wide receiver 19 for us. I'm not super worried about Stefan Gilmore. Will he shadow him while he's on the perimeter? Yes, but they've been kind of ro- they've been moving digs all around. I don't think he's going to see Gilmore 24-7 of this game. And right now, Gilmore is not Gilmore. Right now, Gilmore is not playing up to his 100% potential where he's this lockdown corner like we've grown used to him being. The main reason for that, I believe, is like we were hearing with the trade rumors, I don't think he's 100% committed to the team right now because I don't think he's 100% sure that he's going to be there. So that plays into effect when you're talking about Stephon Diggs, who comes in at wide receiver 19 for us. He still has potential to be a top 12 wide receiver with the amount of targets that he's been seeing. We know it just takes one play for him. He's been as probably as safe as they come when, when it comes to volume at the wide receiver position so far this season. I have no issue with uh, Stephon Diggs being a set it and forget it starter the rest of the way. One guy I do want to talk about is John Brown. Now, I don't have him inside the top 36 uh, I finished these rankings are up on bellyupfantasysports.com. They will get updated through the week. I'm waiting to get confirmation that John Brown's definitely going to play, but I will say that he was able to practice yesterday. So he's trending in the right direction of being able to suit up this week. Once that is confirmed, then I will put him into my rankings and that will probably be, you know, a wide receiver four, a high end wide receiver four with big play capability. They've been wanting to use John Brown when he's been out there. So he's a guy that if you're in a situation where you feel like you got to hit a home run with and he's out there and he's healthy, John Brown is somebody you can go to. Now, if John Brown does play on the flip side, Cole Beasley goes from somebody who's a high volume wide receiver three right now in your lineups to borderline. I don't know if I want to play him that much because when both John Brown and Stephon Diggs are out there, the target share is highly inconsistent when it comes to Cole Beasley. And we all know that the target share is what he needs to maintain his wide receiver three status that he has now kind of built himself into over the past couple of weeks, why he's been getting picked up in a lot of leagues and being played. Otherwise, you know, there's not too much of a high ceiling. He's not a red zone target. He's not a big play guy. If John Brown and Stephon Diggs are out there, I don't know if I really want to go ahead and take the chance on paying Cole Beasley in my flex or as my wide receiver three spot. As it stands right now, though, with us sort of ranking as if John Brown won't play, then he can be a low end wide receiver three for you in that situation. So that's something you're going to have to follow us on social media for at Belly Up MDFF Show. Keep up to date with that to know exactly where their value is going to fall before Sunday. And we'll keep you up to date. Make sure you're following us and checking it out on bellyoffantasysports.com. So let's move on here to the next game that we have for you after the Buffalo and New England game and get to more of these matchups of these, what I think might be low scoring games. And we'll talk about one that I do think will be a shootout on Sunday, which is the Tennessee Titans and the Cincinnati Bengals. This game could very well be the back and forth game of the weekend in in general. Both Tennessee's defense has not been very impressive. They haven't been able to stop much. 
Cincinnati Bengals with Joe Burrow, with the way he has played as of late, have come on strong, at least offensively. He's giving them a chance. Now, they haven't been able to seal the deal because that defense is horrendous as well. But Burrow is keeping them in games. He's giving them a chance. They're able to put up a lot of points to keep up with these other teams right now. I don't see why this game is going to be any different. This is going to be the one game where there's a lot of fantasy points to be had. Ryan Tannehill is a top 10 quarterback for us. Joe Burrow is a top streaming option right hovering around 12 to 15 range this week. After last week's 400-yard performance, we know he has the ceiling to get inside the top three. And I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be shocked if that happened again this week. Of course, you're playing Derrick Henry. He's our RB2 on the week, number two overall on the week. Joe Mixon, Giovanni Bernard, what's going on in that situation? Joe Mixon didn't practice yesterday. I talked about this last week when we were, when we were previewing the Friday show. And I talked about how their buy is next week and week nine. They wouldn't, they still haven't to this point told us exactly what the fush issue is of Joe Mixon. We, we still don't know. We, we think, we think it's a midfoot spring because after kind of watching Chris Carson go through what he's going through, it's very similar to how we watched Joe Mixon and how his prognosis went with his foot issue. So we think based on Chris Carson that it could possibly be a, a midfoot sprain, which means he'll probably miss this week. Like I said, he didn't practice yesterday. I don't expect him to practice today. I don't expect him to play. If their buy was at next week, then there might be more hope if he was getting closer to 100%. But if you're the Cincinnati Bengals and you're not in the playoff race, you're one in six, why would you play your number one paid player on the team when he's not 100% healthy? Why would you bother when you have a bye week the following week and he can come back 100% healthy against the Pittsburgh Steelers in week 10? It doesn't make any sense to me that that's the route that they would take. So I fully, fully anticipate Giovanni Bernard being the starting running back again this week. And if he is, he's a high-end RB too. Every time Bernard is thrust into a situation where he's going to get the majority of the work because he has a high floor, because you know he's going to get five to seven targets in the passing game, along with all the carries, he's going to have a chance to score a touchdown, especially in this game against the Tennessee Titans. Remember, James Conner should have had two. He didn't wind up getting two, but he should have had two. Then he's going to be a high end RB2. If Mixon were to play, we have him ranked just inside the top 10. Either way, whoever the Cincinnati Bengals starting running back is, you're playing them this week with confidence against the Tennessee Titans. Let's get into the wide receiver group because that's where both of these teams really, you're kind of questioning, how does this break down necessarily? Let's start with the Cincinnati Bengals because that, that's been very interesting to me. I think you could play all three of these guys. You could play all three Cincinnati Bengal wide receivers. A.J. Green comes in as the lowest ranked, as you would expect at this point. But he's had three games now where he's been targeted in double digits. He still leads the team in targets, BTW, through seven weeks. I think he's due for a touchdown. He dropped one again last week. I think he's due for a touchdown with the high volume that he's been seeing in the red zone. And the fact that he's playing a better role for where he's at in his career, which is the intermediate, those Robert Woods type of roles. They're not asking him to burn himself out going deep anymore. They're leaving that to T. Higgins. T. Higgins can take care of that. And because this is a team that's throwing the ball 45 times a game right now on average, there's plenty of volume for everybody. I expect this to be a high-scoring game. I think he can play all three. So A.J. Green comes in as a wide receiver three for us, a solid wide receiver three. I like him a lot, especially in PPR leagues, because the reception totals and the targets that he's been seeing. You don't necessarily need him to go over 100 yards. T. Higgins comes in at wide receiver 21 for us, so he's a solid wide receiver two on the day, especially talking about 12-team leagues. He's going to have the highest ceiling of all these wide receivers because he's going to have the big play capability because he's thrust into that role. And he's been playing well, and there's nobody on Tennessee to take that away. And then you have Tyler Boyd, who we have ranked the highest on because he just has the highest floor. He's the safest play. He's the go-to guy right now in the offense. We have him at wide receiver 17. I think you can play all three Cincinnati Bengals wide receivers with some confidence heading into this matchup against the Tennessee Titans. You can't play Drew Sample. That you can't do. He's not a streaming option. He's not even in my top 24 where we're even thinking about him at all. 
flip over to the Tennessee Titans side of the ball, where again, the wide receiver group gets a little bit interesting. Now we know we're going to play AJ Brown. He comes in at wide receiver eight for us on the week. He's a top 10 guy. Shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that that's the case. I think the question is, what do you do about Corey Davis? What do you do about Adam Humphreys? Humphreys, you got to leave off your benches. And frankly, I don't see a reason why you need to keep him on your rosters either. So Adam Humphreys, you go ahead, you leave him off. Corey Davis comes in at wide receiver 31. While I don't love his ceiling, even in a matchup against the Cincinnati Bengals, even when A.J. Brown has been on the field, now we kind of have a little bit more data to go off of. He's still getting targeted at a high clip. In fact, him and A.J. Brown are kind of neck and neck when it comes to targets on the field. It's not, it's not even necessar- he's not even necessarily second fiddle to A.J. Brown when it comes to targets. Now, he doesn't have his capabilities. He's not going to be the guy that they go to when they need a big play. But Corey Davis is somebody that can be considered a wide receiver three, especially this week, who just has a high floor given the volume that he's been seeing. Follow that up with Janu Smith, who's been disappointing over the past few weeks. I still have him as tight end seven coming into this game. Remember, even last week, which for tight ends, the Pittsburgh Steelers are not a good matchup. You can attack them on the perimeter, which is why you saw A.J. Brown do his thing. You saw Corey Davis be heavily involved. You can attack them on the perimeter. You still can't really attack them in the middle of the field. So tight ends are going to always have a hard time when they play the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then the week before, he was banged up. I'm not worried about Janu Smith. He comes in as tight end seven for us on the week. I still think he's going to finish as a top five tight end by the time the season's over. And even last week, he had a good opportunity at an end zone target. He just wasn't quite able to secure the catch coming in, but he could have had a touchdown and we've been having a much different conversation as a result of that. I like Janu Smith this week. It's a good matchup here against Cincinnati. I do believe he's going to get targeted in the red zone. I do believe there's a good chance he's going to have a touchdown. If you have Janu Smith, you're not streaming at the tight end position. You're staying strong and you're playing him as a top 10 tight end again this week. Do not get concerned. Do not get worried about Janu Smith moving forward. He's still very much a part of an offense that likes to utilize the tight end when that opportunity presents itself. And this game is an opportunity that should be presenting itself. What we're going to do now is take a quick break. We still have more games to talk about. We still have the mailbag segment to get to. Everything and that and more on the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. We're going to talk to you guys right after this. It's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And welcome back, MD Nation. You are listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network on your Android app. Or if you have iOS, we are on WWSRN. Best way to download and listen live. And of course, we are also presented to you by Belly Up Sports. And we're talking about the early window of games for week eight in this matchup. Talking about the injuries as we go through them, our fantasy football expectations. Some of the COVID news that came out early this morning about the Chargers and the Giants. So far, there's been nothing new about that coming out thus far to this point. We did have some new news. And because this team is on by, I'll talk about that really quick right now. And that is Gardner Minshew has come back. They said he has multiple fractures and a ligament, a slight ligament tear in his thumb, questionable for week nine. I find that whole thing interesting because this is somebody who was already getting rumored as being benched for Mike Lennon, which we, I think we've pretty much all talked about how it just it makes zero sense. Uh, why you would do that, what the benefit would be for this Jacksonville team. You're not trying to win games now anyway. I know Doug Marone th- thinks he's in a situation where he has to do something to justify him keeping his job. My response to that would be, Doug Marone, you're not keeping your job regardless of what you were doing. They set this team up to fail this season to tank for Trevor Lawrence. Now, you're getting outdone by the New York Jets, unfortunately, and I don't think you planned on that, but that was what this team was built to do. Remember, they gutted pretty much all of their talent for draft picks this upcoming season. That's all that they did. So this team is not for winning right now. I don't know why you'd bench Gardner Minshew for Mike Glennon, but I do think 
the timing of this report coming out about him having multiple fractures, about him having a slight tear in his thumb, definitely believe they are true. I'm not trying to start a conspiracy theory here, but I think the timing of it is very interesting. After two days ago, I believe it was, Doug Marone came out and said they plan on making some changes coming out of the bye week. And I tweeted out because it was already rumored Gardner Minshew might get benched. I was like, this is pretty much setting up the fact that they're going to be going to Mike Glenn, and I believe in week nine. Now, whether it's because of the injury or whether it's because Doug Marone wants the opportunity to just bench him and see what he can get out of Mike Glennon, I guess. I feel like we know what Mike Glennon is at this point. I don't know what it is you're going to get out of him that you haven't already seen previously, or that's going to be that much better than what Minshew is giving you in the first place. It's not going to make you more competitive. That's for sure. I think he's setting it up for that to be the case. So, what that means for DJ Chark moving forward, what that means for everybody, James Robinson, for everybody moving forward. I still believe that you're going to be fine playing James Robinson. I don't believe much is going to change in that um, area. They're still going to run the football. They're still going to throw him in the football out of the backfield. The only thing that might be a little less, I guess, positive, you could say for James Robinson with the benching of Gardner Minshew is that teams will probably squeeze Mike Glennon a little bit more. He's not as aggressive. He's not as willing to let it fly as Minshew is. So I don't think teams are going to respect the deep ball quite as much as they would have out of Minshew, or at least the overall aggressiveness of the offense, I should say. So they're going to kind of count more on James Robinson being more of a focal point, and they may start to squeeze that offense a little bit more, which means more guys in the box for Robinson and stuff like that. But it's not going to change being able to play James Robinson every single week, given the running back landscape, number one. But number two, the volume he's been getting and how he has been playing. Uh, So I don't think that changes much there. DJ Chark, I know that he's been a bit of a disappointment and they don't really have a great schedule for DJ Chark the rest of the way. It's going to be kind of hit or miss. So I don't think he's going to be a set it and forget it wide receiver at any point this season. But the targets have been there. I don't believe the targets are going to change if Mike Lennon is the quarterback either as far as him leading the way. If anything, I think it will be a little bit of an improvement for DJ Chark because I don't trust Mike Lennon to keep guys like Keelan Cole keep guys like LaVisca Chanel involved enough for them to be able to make an impact. I think they're going to lean way heavily on DJ Chark being able to be the wide receiver with Mike Lennon in there as the quarterback. So in that sense, it could help DJ Chark's floor at the very least, but it's going to hurt the Jacksonville offense as a whole, which will hurt their scoring opportunities, which will hurt everyone's ceiling. So ultimately, you don't want to see, no matter who you have as part of this Jaguars team, you don't want to see Minshew get benched unless it truly is due for injury and he's going to come back once he's healed. And I do believe that's going to be the case because I think if they do go Mike Lennon in week nine, I think literally by week 10, we're going to see Minshew back out there because that's how horrendous it will be in week nine. So I don't have to worry about that. But I digress. That was what I wanted to get into because that news just came over while we were on break. Let's go ahead and continue on with our early matchup previews, starting off this segment with the Raiders and the Bal- and the Baltimore Ravens. Whew. The Cleveland Browns, who used to, used to be the Cleveland Browns and the Baltimore Ravens, so maybe that's where my mind went there. This is a game that is going to be close. I don't think it's going to be a particularly high-scoring game either. I think both defenses set it up in a way where people think that it might be. But because I believe that with OBJ out and the way the Raiders have been calling plays as of late, I think you're going to see two pretty conservative approaches in this game. It's going to be a feel-out game. It's going to be, what are you throwing at me? It's going to be, what can I do effectively and consistently? Josh Jacobs, I believe, gets back into the top 10 in this ballgame. We have him ranked at 10 on the dot and half point PPR leagues. Cleveland's a team that you can run on. Miles Garrett is a little bit banged up. So that, as long as that continues to be the case, that'll open up additional pathway for Josh Jacobs to get going again. I don't know if the Raiders are going to have Trent Brown back. And of course, if you're a Josh Jacobs owner, you really want to see him back in there. But the rest of the offensive line, as of right now, at least, should be getting the chance to play again this week, practice again this week, which was something they weren't able to do last week. So I expect them to be a little bit better, a little bit sharper. The Raiders sound like they're going to get Brian Edwards back, which from a fantasy standpoint, isn't really anything relevant. But what he does do is you offer that big wide receiver on the perimeter that frees up Henry Ruggs and, and lately Nelson Aguilar, I guess, too to kind of be able to rotate in and out and do their little thing and get mismatches on the other side where you're going to possibly see 
Denzel Ward lined up on Brian Edwards quite a bit in this game if he's able to go. So that, from an NFL standpoint, from a schematic standpoint, that's why that could be important, quite frankly, especially if you have Henry Ruggs, who this week we have his wide receiver 35. He didn't make my top 36 last week, but he does come in as a low-end wide receiver three with some upside because I believe if he gets matchups on the backside corner of the Cleveland Browns, he's going to have a chance for a big play in this game. So I think if you're sitting around there and you don't have much to offer this week because it is a lot of bye weeks this week and you're looking for somebody to hit you a home run, I think Henry Ruggs is a guy that you can take that shot on. And he should be able to deliver for you. He's being targeted a little bit more and more. This is the second game back coming off the injury. I think he'll be a little bit closer to 100% healthy. All in all, I think at the end of the day, I think you could do worse than Henry Ruggs in this week, given what some of the roster constructions are going to be. So we have him as a low-end wide receiver three with some upside in this game. And, of course, you're playing Darren Waller. He's a top five tight end first. He comes in number four overall. It's a good matchup for him against Cleveland Browns. Has an excellent chance of being able to score in this one. He's been the most trusted target again this season for the Raiders, just like he was last year. You're playing Darren Waller. His ceiling hasn't been every week the way it was last year. He's had some tough matchups here and there. He's still just as safe as it comes when you're talking about the tight end position right now and putting him into the top five. We move on to Cleveland Brown side of the ball. Baker Mayfield, and I didn't even talk about this. Derek Carr and Baker Mayfield, we actually have ranked right next to each other. Carr at 12, Mayfield at 13. And it's just given the matchups, right? And given the way that these two guys have played as of late, they actually enter a streaming territory. Now, I don't feel good about Baker Mayfield being in my streaming territory when it comes to my rankings at the quarterback position, but it's the Raiders. He's been playing much better as of late. The running game hasn't been as effective without Nick Chubb. And I think that's become everybody's surprise. Everybody thought Kareem Hunt was going to be a top five running back with no Nick Chubb, given the volume he was going to get and the offensive system that he's in. That hasn't taken shape. Now, he's been very good. He's been top 10. He's, he's still been an RB1, he's, but he's been a low in RB1, not an elite RB1. And that has played into the NFL side of things on the field with Baker Mayfield where he's had to be a little bit more aggressive. Now, I know in this game, he doesn't have OBJ. But let's be real, I don't think OBJ was having such a significant impact that the offensive passing attack is going to take this huge step down heading into this week against the Raiders. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to be the situation. I don't think that's going to be the case. Jarvis Landry comes in at wide receiver 23 for us. I think he's going to be looking at a significant tick in volume than what he has seen so far to this point. So he should have a high floor. I believe he's looking at at least eight targets in this game in a plus matchup. Rashard Higgins is just, just outside our wide receiver 36. So just outside our wide receiver threes, more of a high-end wide receiver four. But I think he is an option if you're looking around the league and you're like, well, who do I play for You know, who and who and such and such that I don't have this week? Depending on your roster construction, I think there are worse options out there than a Rashard Higgins. I think he's worth a flyer on if you find yourself in that situation where you're looking around the league for a body. I do think he's looking at probably six to seven targets minimum in this game as well. He's going to be more of the deep down the field threat while Jarvis Landry will continue in his role. His role is not going to change. Just I believe his volume will be upticked. Harrison Bryant is a top 10 tight end for us. And I don't think this should come as any surprise. This is a guy who was being targeted in the red zone before Austin Hooper went out. Is clearly now the starter for Austin Hooper being gone now. Had two touchdowns last week. He's probably been the most productive rookie tight end to this point, I, I would say. I don't, nobody else is jumping off the page and off the top of my head right now as far as their production as a rookie tight end. He's been impressive. I think he's actually better than Austin Hooper because I think he actually has a more athletic skill set and he does all the blocking and all the dirty work that they like Hooper for in the first place. So Harrison Bryant comes in as a top 10 tight end for us. Unfortunately, it's a one week thing because they're going to have their buy in week nine. And from what we understand, Hooper has a very good chance to come back and play in week 10. So I think it's only for a one more week thing. But if you pick up Harrison Bryant, I think you're streaming a top 10 tight end this week. Against the Raiders, I don't know anybody could argue that. So we move on. We move on to the Colts. We move on to the Detroit Lions. 
this is a game I'm going to be honest, I don't have a great feel for out of, you know, a select few players. Jonathan Taylor, he comes in at running back eight for us. We expect him to be top 10 running back against Detroit Lions. Obviously, we feel pretty good about that. But outside of that, and you have kickers, Rodrigo Blankenship. He's been excellent this season. I don't think there's another Colts player I'm trying to play this week. Michael Pittman might be back this week. It sounds like he's going to be. He was back at practice. T.Y. Hilton's been not ranked for, not, at least not in the top 36 for us since week one, really, frankly. Zach Paschal, I think, actually probably has the highest floor out of the Colt wide receivers. And you're looking at the Detroit Lions. This is a game in which you, you would think that you could take advantage of, that you would want to play wide receivers against. But I'm not seeing it. I don't see, because Phillip Rivers has been so bad, because there hasn't been a wide receiver who's been able to establish themselves, I don't see a pass catcher that I feel confident even playing against the Detroit Lions. That includes the tight end position. I know Trey Burton's been kind of leading the way since he's been back in that. He's only been okay. Molly Mo Cox could be back this week. He, he's going to be back in a practicing in a limited fashion. It might not be this week, but it could be this week. Jack Doyle is still out there. And even Burton, even though he's been leading the way, you're still looking at maybe five targets at a very low floor, touchdown dependent, not much like any other tight end. He's, he's not in our top 24. We're not, to, we're not looking at him as a possible streamer this week either. So I look at Jonathan Taylor, and I'm not playing anybody else in the Colts with any kind of confidence whatsoever. Naeem Hines comes in just outside the RB3 territory. If this somehow turned into the game where in the second half, these two offenses kind of have to go back and forth in a rush to win. I could see Naeem Hines being more involved in entering that RB3 territory, especially when you're talking about it from a full-point PPR league because he should have the matchup and he's still the pass catching back. But on the flip side of that, I don't see why the Colts wouldn't be able to stick with the running game. And also, I have this feeling, kind of similar to the Detroit Lions when they came out of the bye, that the Colts are going to look at their tape they're going to self-evaluate, and then they're going to come to the decision that, hey, you know what? Jonathan Taylor needs to get the ball more. Jonathan Taylor needs to be the bell cow moving forward. If we're serious about being a playoff team, if we're serious about trying to find an identity before that comes, you are going to have to build this offense around Jonathan Taylor moving forward, around the play-action game. That's what this offense is going to have to be built around. None of this Jordan Wilkins gets nine carries for absolutely no reason. And you need to cut down on the amount of Naeem Hines being involved on passing downs because Jonathan Taylor can catch the ball. We're not, we're not talking about Jordan Howard out there. He can catch the ball. He can involved in all three downs. And I've been talk I talked about this with the New England Patriots. Make your play calling less predictive. If Phillip Rivers is going to be a guy who can't take deep shot anymore because his arm's shot, and that's why T.Y. Hilton hasn't been a factor at all in any case, well, then you're going to have to build this game around the running game. And I know the offensive line is underachieved to this point, but they still have a talented offensive line who I believe if they make a focus to get more physical, a focus to get going again, they will get back up to what we expected them to be. And Jonathan Taylor will start to have more holes to run through. That should start with this game against the Detroit Lions. This should be a perfect get right game for that running attack in general. So that's kind of what I expect to see happen in this game, which is why I have confidence in Taylor, but no confidence in anybody else. So we flip it over to the Detroit Lions side. This is a good Colts defense. Darius Leonard is expected to play. He's coming back off that groin injury. He is practicing. When Darius Leonard plays, the Colts are a top five defense, arguably. The offensive play, again, the offensive play calling the Detroit Lions has been horrendous. It's been so conservative. We saw at the end of that game against the Atlanta Falcons with Matthew Stafford that he's still Matthew Stafford. He's still letting it rip. He can still be aggressive down the field, and he still has the weapons to do it. Why? Why on earth are you trying to compact this conservative philosophy if you're Matt Patricia? It's not helping you win games that much. It's really not. It's not playing to your strengths. That defense isn't very good. You've beaten some bad teams. But against a good team like the Indianapolis Colts, you're going to have to be aggressive. You're going to have to take chances. Matthew Stafford's going to have to be allowed to be Matthew Stafford. That's not going to happen in this game. And that's why Matthew Stafford is not going to be a streaming option against the Colts defense. 
but it's also why I have concern about him moving forward. He should be better than what he is. It's really kind of frustrating to see. And it's also kind of frustrating to see that the Detroit Lions are winning the games that they are because now it's like, well, will, will Matt Patricia get fired? Because we kind of need him to be. DeAndre Swift is RB22 for us. We have him as a low-end RB2. Adrian Peterson is a low-end RB3. Comes in at 36 for us. Because we talk about this from a half-point, 12-team PPR standpoint. Peterson still has gotten more carries than DeAndre Swift coming out of the bye. Now, it's been much more of a 50-50 split, and Swift has been getting the receiving work, which is why he's now catapulted in front of Adrian Peterson as far as his fantasy potential as far as his fantasy value. But Peterson's still a guy who can fall in the end zone. I don't think you want to play him against the Colts, but there's few running backs out there that have touchdown capabilities along with the possibility of getting 14 carries a game. That's kind of what Peterson's looking at at this point. So he sneaks into our 36. I hope you have a better option, a more upside option this week. And with DeAndre Swift, he just has a high floor with the receiving of uh, statistics that he's been able to put up over the past few weeks. So that's why he's a low in RB2. Kenny Galladay, wide receiver 18. He's still not quite guy. He finally got over 100 yards last week. But again, I was against the Atlanta Falcons. And again, that was really mostly due to that last big play on the last drive where they had no choice but to let Matthew Stafford cook. I'm going to take the Russell Wilson cook, let Matthew Stafford cook. Until Matthew Stafford gets to cook on a more consistent basis earlier than just the fourth quarter, earlier than just the game-winning drive at the end of the game, I don't know if Kenny Galladay is ever at any point going to have the ceiling that he had last year. He's still going to be a threat for the big play. He's still going to be a threat for the red zone. But the volume is just not there because his offense is just not throwing the ball nearly as much. Now, when they get to play the teams like the Packers and stuff like that, I think they're going to be thrust into situations where they're going to have to throw the ball more than they've wanted to in most, in most games. We kind of saw that the first time around against the Packers. Galladay wasn't quite back in game shape yet at that point. But Kenny Galli is going to continue just to be more of a wide receiver two than a guy who could be a low-end wide receiver one due to this issue. Marvin Jones is nothing. He finally, he finally looked like he had a pulse last week, but that gave you no confidence whatsoever. It was against the Atlanta Falcons. It's only five catches for 80 yards. You're telling me that's the ceiling now? So Marvin Jones isn't somebody who's in a top 36 position. He's not somebody we're playing. And TJ Hawkinson, while he was my top five tight end last week and came through on that final touchdown for me, thankfully, because otherwise it was looking kind of brutal. With Darius Leonard back in the lineup, he's tight end 21. I don't think you can play TJ Hawkinson this week. So we're playing DeAndre Swift and Kenny Galladay. And outside of that, I don't know if I want to play anybody else on the Detroit Lions because I've been so disappointed by the overall conservative philosophy of that offense. So let's move on to the Minnesota Vikings and the Green Bay Packers, which outside of the Tennessee Titan and the Cincinnati Bengal game, I think is the other one that has at least shootout potential, a lot of fantasy points that could be involved. Obviously, we know with the Green Bay Packers side, we'll run through that quickly. Rodgers, he's our QB2 on the week. He's just been lighting it up, letting it fly. I believe the Minnesota Vikings will be able to do enough offensively to keep this game and keep the Green Bay Packers aggressive through most of the game until they pull it out probably in the fourth quarter. But most of the game, enough where Rodgers is going to put up pretty good production. They have nothing that can cover Devontae Adams. He's our wide receiver one coming into this week. I don't think that should be a surprise for anybody. Outside of that, you're trying to evaluate the running back situation. There seems to be a decent chance, unfortunately, that Aaron Jones isn't going to play this week. It seems a lot of the Green Bay Packer beat writers, the, the Packers themselves, you had Matt LaFleur come out and said, we have to be very, very careful. I mean, the vibe that we had last week was that it was going to be a one-week deal that last week for them ruling him out last Sunday was them being very, very careful and that he would come back healthy this week. Now it seems like that might not be the case so much. Now it kind of sounds like Aaron Jones might truly be questionable heading into this week, and it might be Jamal Williams again. That was the other thing that we learned last week. A.J. Dillon's not as much of a factor as people were anticipating him to be. We went into that Sunday being told, hey, A.J. Dillon and Jamal Williams are going to split kind of like Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams do already with Williams maybe getting a little bit more of the work, being more of the lead guy. Now, we felt good about playing Williams because we know he's going to be the pass catching down because A.J. Dillon doesn't give you much in the passing game. But he wasn't involved really at all. If Aaron Jones doesn't play this week, 
I kind of expected the same thing. I don't, I don't see why A.J. Dillon would suddenly be involved for this game when he wasn't last week. I guess the Minnesota Vikings especially. So Jamal Williams would become a high-end RB2, possibly a low-end RB1 against the Minnesota Vikings if Aaron Jones does not play. If Jones does play, then he's a top seven running back for us this week. Because we do anticipate that even if Jones does play, Williams could still be an RB3, especially when talking about PPR leagues. Because if they do want to be careful with him, even if he's out there, we would expect Williams to get maybe a little bit more of the work and probably get most of the receiving work. So he's going to have a decent little floor. So when we talk about PPR, uh, I expect Jamal Williams, even with a healthy Aaron Jones, to be an RB3 territory, to be a possible flex play. Alan Lazard is getting activated off the IR. He's not going to come back this week, but he has that 21-day window now where he's going to be practicing. So he's going to probably be back sooner rather than later, which is good news. It sounded like the Packers were actually looking around to see what kind of wide receivers that they could get. You know, they were, they were sitting there, you know, they were reportedly had interest in Will Fuller and seeing what he could provide for them. Doesn't sound like that's going to wind up working out, but it's interesting that they were looking around and poking around for something like that. So Alan Lazar might be back sooner rather than later. And because Marquez Valdez-Scantling has turned into absolutely nothing in his absence, I see nothing prohibiting Lazar from entering being the wide receiver two on the Green Bay Packers and therefore being a wide receiver three for us in fantasy football. So if you have the IR spot and Alan Lazard's been out there, go ahead and stash him because he's going to be somebody of value moving forward. Robert Tanya does come in our streaming tight end territory. He's our tight end 16 on the week. He's more of a guy that is more low, more low end streamer. Hasn't really done it the past couple of weeks since Devontae Adams has come back. I still believe that they're in search of a true second pass catcher. Now, last week that was Jamal Williams, and it could be Jamal Williams again this week, quite frankly. Uh, but I do believe I do believe in Robert Tanyan's value. I do think he I don't think he's a fluke. I think he's something legitimate. I think he's a solid tight end. I think he's a solid red zone target. And I don't think it can always, always only go to Devontae Adams. So I think Robert Tanya is somebody who's a streaming of notes. He's not a must stream. He's not our top end stream. That would be a Richard Rodgers if he's still out there. That would be a Harrison Bryant of the Cleveland Browns. But he is somebody that I think you can play with some hope that he scores a touchdown and a plus match against the Minnesota Vikings. So let's talk about the Vikings on the other side. First and foremost, the most important thing, Dalvin Cook's back. He's going to be good to go. He's practicing. Uh, No-brainer, top three running back for us this week. Still, if you have Alexander Madison, I mean, and this should be a no-brainer if you're a Dalvin Cook owner, but let's say if you're not a Dalvin Cook owner and you picked up Alexander Madison, you still should be holding on to him because you, it's a groin issue. We know the soft tissue injury history with Dalvin Cook. You want to see if he actually gets through this game healthy, I think, before you move on from Alexander Madison and vacate that roster spot. So keep him if you have him. Now, Adam Thielen, Justin Jefferson, must place. Adam Thielen will most likely see Jair Alexander, who's been very... We talked about this last week with Will Fuller, why I wasn't so big on Will Fuller last week. He's going to probably see him most of the way. Adam Thielen is a more complete wide receiver than Will Fuller. He's an excellent route runner, which good route runners have been able to beat Alexander consistently in the past. He doesn't match well as well with them. He matches up better with the athletic types who lean on their athleticism to get open, a la a Will Fuller, a la why he played well against him. And Fuller really only saved his day because he got the touchdown at the end. I expect Adam Thielen to be fine. He's our wide receiver three this week. Because I expect the Vikings to have to come back from behind in this game. I expect them to throw the ball quite a bit in the second half. It's really the only thing I'm a little bit worried about when it comes to Dalvin Cook's floor. Now, he's been able to provide in the past because he's such a touchdown scorer that he'll find a way, even if he's not getting the touches that you want. My hope is that them coming off the bye, they recognize that they need to throw the ball to the running backs a heck of a lot more than what they've been doing as part of their offense. We'll see if that actually comes to fruition or not. But that's why I worry a little bit about Dalvin Cook because I could easily see this being a game in which the Vikings have to come back from behind in the second half. And as a result to that, will uh, maybe possibly you see Dalvin Cook get like that 12 carry area again, like you saw kind of early on in the season. But I'm not saying to be concerned about Dalvin Cook. What I am saying is that that's going to amp the volume of Adam Thielen against Jared Alexander, which is why he comes in a top three wide receiver for us, even in this matchup. 
and Justin Jefferson, who has the mismatch on the other side because you can attack the backside secondary of the Green Bay Packers, especially if you have a good wide receiver. Justin Jefferson is our wide receiver 14 on the week, and he does have wide receiver one potential, top 10 wide receiver potential this week. And we've seen him have these big plays in a game in which I expected to be a little bit extra volume for the passing game. Justin Jefferson is a very confident play for us this week. I'm just not touching the tight ends. That's it. I mean, I'm just not going to touch the tight ends. So let's move on to the Jets, the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't know if people, if you're not a big better, you're probably not aware of this. And if you are, you already know. But the Jets are 19 and a half dogs. I mean, that's crazy. I, ha- I can't remember the last time I've seen a minus 19 and a half line on an NFL game. I mean, that's absolutely insane. And the best part is I would probably still bet Kansas City if I actually wanted to bet on that game. I would still take minus 19 and a half points because that's just how much better they are than, than the Jets in this one. Now, I know against the Buffalo Bills, they looked a tad more competitive than what they had. But this is also a Bills team that wasn't playing well as of late. The Chiefs are, are fine. Even when they're not playing well, which you could, you could argue they didn't have their best game overall against the Denver Broncos. They still put up plus 40 points. So <laughs> you play in everybody. Patrick Mahomes is our number one quarterback on the week, but I am a little bit concerned about Mahomes' floor to some degree because it wouldn't surprise me if this game turned into something similar that we saw against the Denver Broncos a week ago where defense dominated the running game could do whatever it wants to. And as a result of that, Patrick Holmes, you see at the end of the day, when you go to look at the box score, that he only actually threw the ball maybe 25 times. So there actually is some worry about there being kind of a lower floor for Mahomes than there normally would. And what should be on paper, one of the greatest matchups you could a- actually ask for for Mahomes, just because they, they might dominate this game so early, so wide of a margin that it is there's no reason to continue to throw the ball down the field. So I am a little bit worried about his floor. I'm a little bit worried about Kelsey's floor. I'm a little bit worried about Tyreek Hill's floor as a result to all those things. I think if you're going to get the fantasy points that you want out of those guys, you're going to have to hope that it comes in the first half when they're being aggressive, because I believe in the second half, you're going to see a lot of CEH and you're going to see a lot of Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell, mark my words, is going to score a touchdown. They are going to give him an opportunity to score a touchdown against the New York Jets. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And given the amount of times they should be in the red zone against the New York Jets in this game, I don't see how he doesn't score at least one touchdown. Am I in love with the touches? No, absolutely not. He comes in at RB23 for us, though. He's a low-end RB2 in a situation with CEH and Le'Veon Bell. The best-case scenario would be something similar to what we saw last week against the Denver Broncos, where it was actually close to a 50-50 split as far as carries go. And that's the best-case scenario I think you can expect for Le'Veon Bell. I think more times than not, it will be a 60-40 split in favor of CEH. But in this game against the New York Jets, if they get up big in the second half, I would not be surprised if they turned us into the Le'Veon Bell show. And I definitely think once they have the opportunity, they're going to give Le'Veon a chance to score a touchdown. So I think you can play him as an RB too. He might only get 12 touches. But 12 touches on the Kansas City Chiefs against the Jets puts you in the RB2 conversation. And you have to play, you have to continue to play CEH. He will still be the guy more times not who gets more of the work in the Kansas City offense in a plus matchup. You're not gonna you're not gonna fret about playing him. But we do have him as RB13 in this game. I do think there's a little bit lower of a floor. He hasn't been a superstar throughout this season. And now he's in a situation where I don't believe at any point from the rest of the year he will see 20 carries in a game. Not with Le'Veon Bell on the roster. It's not gonna happen. CH is going to have to do his damage on 13 to 15 touches. Now he can still do it. He's still going to be a high end RB two, even with that amount of work with the Kansas city chiefs. But I think on a consistent basis, you're looking at about 15 touches total between carries and receiving maybe 18. If it's a game in which the chiefs are blowing out their opponent and they just kind of lean on the running backs, but with Le'Veon bell on the roster, he's not going to touch the 20 opportunity threshold anymore. It's not going to happen. So you have to play him more as a high-end RB2. I think the potential, the hope, 
the possibility of him being an RB1, I think, has gone out the window with the signing of Le'Veon Bell. Even in this week. Still more of a high-end RB2 than he is a low-end RB1. And Tyreek Hill, you're still going to play him. He's our, he's our wide receiver seven, even though I'm a little concerned about the floor. Travis Kelsey's our tight end two. You're still going to play these guys, but maybe temper your expectations just given what the expected game script's going to be heading into this one. That's all. On the Jets side of the ball, Jameis Crowder sounds like he's going to get back to practice today. Uh, he was, it sounds like he's going to get a limited practice in, but he's really hindered by that groin injury. Normally speaking, I would go into this game and I would say he's actually a volume-based low-end wide receiver too, who has a little bit more upside than that because of the Kansas City Chiefs. He's the slot receiver, which is where the mismatch against this Chiefs defense predominantly is. And because of the volume of what he's seeing with Sam Darnold back in the lineup, he should, should be seeing double-digit targets. So if he plays, I think all of that still goes into effect for Jameson Crowder. I think he can still play Jameson Crowder. But deal, being that he's dealing with this groin issue, I'm a little bit fearful of leaning on him necessarily. A little bit fearful of it. So I would, I'm not going to just jump at the opportunity to play Jameson Crowder. I'm going to keep my eyes on the practice report. Make sure you're following us at Belly Up MDFF Show on Twitter. We'll keep you up to date throughout, throughout the week. But he is somebody who could be an option for you in your lineups. That's it, though. Not playing Michael P. Ryan. I'm not playing Brashad Perryman. I'm not playing Denzel Mims. I'm not playing anybody else. It's Jameson Crowder, no one else. I know people out there want to say, well, Perrine should still be a speculative ad. Why? Was Le'Veon Bell all that fantasy relevant with Adam Gase when he was on the team and seeing uh, uh, what should have been a workload of carries? No, because Frank Gore is not going anywhere. He's not. As long as Adam Gase is the head coach, Frank Gore isn't going anywhere. So why this idea that LaMichael P. Ryan should be a guy who's a speculative ad as a running back for the New York Jets makes zero sense to me. You're never going to feel good about playing him, ever, at any point. If Adam Gase were to get fired, then I would be okay with the idea of adding LeMichael P. Ryan as a speculative ad. But until that actually happens, is Jamison Crowder, I want nothing else to do with the Jets. Let's move on. Actually, you know what? First, let's go ahead. We're going to take our last break. We have a couple more games to talk about, and then we have the mailbag segment for you guys on the other side right after these messages on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. It's the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. You're listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And welcome back, MD Nation, to the show. You are listening to the MD's Fantasy Football Show on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network on your Android apps or if you have iOS on WWSR and also presented to you by Belly Up Sports. We've been talking about the early window of week eight matchup previews, talking about all the fantasy uh, analysis that we have for you, all of our expectations, all the injury news. We talk about the COVID situations between the Chargers and the Giants. We're continuing on now with two more games to talk about. And of course, we'll have a mailbag segment for you before we go ahead and wrap up the show that you can always get on or at least just want to contact us and get your fantasy football dilemmas sorted out. You can always hit us up on social media at Belly Up MDFF Show. We're always going to be here for you guys throughout the season. So we're moving along. We're about to cap off the show here with the last two games we're going to talk about in this episode. We'll be back tomorrow from 12 to 1.30, same time, same place for you guys on the Worldwide Sports Radio Network. And we want to talk about the Rams and the Dolphins. We want to talk about the debut of Tua Tagalavoa. Now, he comes at his QB 20 for us. This is a pretty good Rams defense. I don't see him being a guy that you want to go ahead and play in his rookie debut against a good defense. But we're all, all eyes are going to be on because we want to see... What are you going to do? What is your reads going to be? Where are you at in your mental preparation? Do we have hope for you to be able to take this offense possibly to the next level? Or do we now have to be concerned about what Devontae Parker might be for the rest of the year? Do we have to be concerned about the potential of Preston Williams turning on in the second half? Do we have to be concerned about teams squeezing this offense and gearing more towards Miles Gaskin where he loses his low-end RB2 appeal? Do we have to be concerned about those things? Or are you going to take what Ryan Fitzpatrick had been doing, which was making this a competent offense so far to this point, and continue that on and prove the Miami Dolphin coaching staff correct that they went with you for a reason that you are able to take them over the top because they are in playoff contention team and actually get them into the playoffs? 
That's what we're looking for. All in one game. All in one game against the Los Angeles Rams. Those are all the questions that we are going to have as we are watching this game. Now, I don't feel good about anyone in particular in this one. We do have Miles Gaskin at RB21. So he is a low-end RB2. The volume still has been there. We expect him to try to take some pressure off of Tua Tagovailoa. So while it, while it's through the rushing game or through the receiving game, we expect Miles Gaskin to have a decent floor. Will he... Will he have the touchdown potential you're necessarily looking for? No, but he has a high floor based on the volume that we would expect for him to have. So I think you can still play Miles Gaskin as that low in RB2, as that high end flex play that you've been playing him as pretty much to this point anyway. I think the question is Devontae Parker. I don't think you play Preston Williams in this game. He's been a little too hit or miss anyway. The targets really haven't gone his way as much, and you don't know really what you're getting out of Tua Tagovailoa when it comes to Preston Williams. So you're not really going to play him, but Devontae Parker only comes in as our wide receiver 32 this week. Now, largely this is due to the matchup. Largely due to the fact that he will probably see Jalen Ramsey more times than not. Now, remember, Ramsey doesn't always shadow. So I'm not necessarily that no matter where Parker lines up, Ramsey's going to be there in his hip pocket, but he does typically line up on the side of the field where Ramsey is. So he's going to see Ramsey more times than not in this game. And I don't love that matchup. Parker's been good. He hasn't been awesome. He hasn't been what he was at the second half of last season. But I, at the end of the day, I'm not too concerned about him because he's going to see a high volume. I still think you can play him as a wide receiver three, as a flex play. He's still going to probably see at least eight targets in this game. He should still be the number one read for to attack Lavoa. There's no question about that. He's still a talented wide receiver. And there is there, Jalen Ramsey is one of the corners, one of the top corners, I should say, in the NFL that you can take advantage of at times. Because he likes to get a little too aggressive. He likes to keep his eyes in the backfield a little too often. So sometimes you can catch him on a double move and beat him deep. And that's why that opens up the door for Parker to not be completely shut out in this game. But I don't love the matchup. There is a low floor that comes with him with a rookie quarterback against a good defense that has a top corner that he's going to be seeing a lot of the way. So I do think he has a low floor, but he can still be a wide receiver three in your lineups. The other question I think people are going to have is Mike Kosicki. What do you do with him? I don't think he's as bad. I, there's a lot of people who have now turned on Mike Kosicki and come more on, on my end of the spectrum of I don't think he's that great of a football player. I just think he's a better athlete than he is a football player. But he's still tight end 14. Tua is going to have to lean on somebody when it comes to the red zone. And if Parker's getting taken away by Jalen Ramsey for the most part, well, then Mike Kosicki should be the main red zone target, I would imagine. Again, a lot of this is going to be hypothetical. It's going to be speculation because we don't have any data to go off of with Tua and the NFL yet. We just don't. And this is a tough matchup to kind of begin with. With the tight end landscape being what it is, this team is going into a bye I think Mike Gusecki is going to be one of the more security blanket targets that the Dolphins are going to try to set up for him in this game, which is why I think he's still in that streaming territory. If you have a better option, if you have a tight end with a higher floor, absolutely go with that. I'm not going to feel great about playing Mike Gusecki, but I don't think he's just completely outside of the streaming land that some people are putting him at right now either. We flip this over to the Ram side of the ball they got to figure, they're kind of like, they're not as bad as the Patriots, obviously, but they're kind of like the Patriots in the sense of what we talked about, which is there's nothing on that offense is making defenses feel afraid about them being able to attack deep. They're, they don't have necessarily that, that deep down the field threat player, but they're also not setting up opportunities for people to take those shots with. I mean, Sean McVay right now, he's still using motion. He's still trying to get mismatches. So their offense will always at least be competent to some degree. I think we even saw that against Chicago Bears, which their defense is playing really, really well this season. So that was a tough defense that they played against and still put up 24 points on. No small task. But it was ugly at times, and it's been ugly at times for the Rams so far this season outside of really the beginning of the year. To the point now where we're talking about Cooper Cup, we're talking about Robert Woods as more wide receiver threes. They're not wide receiver twos anymore. They're not automatic plays anymore. Now, I think you can play them in this game. I think, like I said, they're wide receiver threes. They're high-end wide receiver threes. They have pretty good floors, I believe, in this game. I think Cooper Cup, given that he's more of the slot receiver, will have more of a mismatch in this one than Robert Woods will. So I think this will be a little bit more of a Cooper Cup game than it is a Robert Woods game. 
but I don't think you can walk in with the confidence that you're going to get wide receiver two play out of either one of these guys right now, because the offense is just, it's so within 12 yards, everything they're doing is just within 12 yards and it's making defenses be able to squeeze them and, and play them really tightly. And it's not, even though they're getting, trying to get uh, motion or trying to get mismatches, it's not really opening up the windows of opportunity that Sean McVay wants this offense to be able to do. So until they find a way to get aggressive and get some of these safeties out of the box and not allow NFL defenses to squeeze them anymore, there's going to be low floors when it comes to a Cooper Cup, a Robert Woods, a Jared Goff the passing game in particular. And then when you're talking about the tight end situation, who knows what's going on? Tyler Higby wound up being inactive. It looks like he's going to be active this week. He's been questionable, but if he's active this week, then Gerald Everett's not even a streaming option for you. So I don't think he could play a tight end on the Rams right now. Golf comes in as our QB 14. So he's a low end streamer. He's had a pretty high floor, but this is on the road. He doesn't play as well on the road. So there should be some guys that have a higher ceiling than him, but he does have a decent floor, I believe, against the Miami Dolphins this week. Darrell Henderson is the running back that you want to play for the Rams. He comes as RB17 for us. Malcolm Brown is an RB3. Obviously, he's a hit or miss RB3 because obviously he's a guy who, if he doesn't score a touchdown, who knows what you're going to get out of him. I understand that, but Cam Akers just looks like he's the odd man out now. It looks like this is this is going to revolve around Darren Henderson and Malcolm Brown's been going on for a few weeks now. Again, it's one of those situations where would you be surprised that all of a sudden Cam Akers comes in and gets eight carries? No, not necessarily, but we're not expecting it anymore at this point. I think we can solidify our expectations of Darren Henderson's the lead guy. He's going to probably get at least 16 opportunities, if not more, depending on how the game script of the game of, of the flow is going. So we have him at running back 17 and Malcolm Brown is a guy that if you have, if you need something to throw in your flex, if you need some guy with a touchdown potential, he could be that guy. Hopefully you have better options with more of a ceiling than that, but he's getting enough opportunities where he can be a guy that's involved in that decision process as well. So let's talk about our last early window heading into week eight. Let's talk about the Steelers and the Baltimore Ravens. Now this is going to be the game of the week, but not from a fantasy standpoint. I believe these are two good defenses these are two divisional opponents that have will, I think, more likely, usually in the first matchup, will be more of a slobber knocker type of game than it will be a high scoring type of game. They, use, they seem to have one of each, whereas like one game they'll, they'll you know be a shootout, the other game will kind of be a slobber knocker type of deal. Being that this is in Baltimore, they're coming off the bye, they've had the extra week of preparation. I believe we're going to see a tight knit game. I believe you're going to see both of these teams kind of go into it trying to feel one another out. I don't know if you're going to see anybody come out and just try to punch the other one in the mouth and be super aggressive early on. It'd be nice to see, but I don't know that's what we're going to see. So I think from a fantasy standpoint, I don't know how many points are really going to be scored in this game. That'd be the only thing I'm a little bit concerned about. Now, on the Steelers side of the ball, James Conner is still an RB18 for us. He's still a high end RB2. You continue to play him. He's been the bell cow. He's getting all the work. He's getting the receiving work, which is the most important point, especially when you're talking about the Baltimore Ravens and the running back situation. If you have a running back who catches the ball, then they have a decent floor. What he's going to do as far as actual rushing attacks go, I think you're hoping he falls into the end zone. But he has a decent floor with the receiving game, which is why he's RB18 for us. I think Juju's a high-end wide receiver three. I know he had a better showing last week with Deontay Johnson on the field. They finally got both of them involved, double-digit targets. I'm not ready after one game to feel super confident that Schuster can come back into the wide receiver two conversation. He's going to have to do that a little bit more consistently. But I do think against the Baltimore Ravens, the one thing you have been able to do, kind of similar to the Pittsburgh Steelers, is that you can still kind of attack them to some degree on the perimeter. You can't attack their front seven very well, but you can't attack if you can spread them out enough, if you can get enough time to throw the ball, you can't attack them on the perimeter. So wide receivers have been able to be somewhat effective against these two really good defenses. So that's why I believe Juju smith is a wide receiver three. Deontay Johnson, who we do expect to play in this game, we expect him to come back and practice today, even though he didn't practice yesterday, but we expect him back. We have him as a low-end wide receiver too, because again, he is the number one target on the Pittsburgh Steelers when he's on the in the on the field when he's in the game and I think he proved that last week because while Schuster got one more target than him it wasn't until he was yanked late in that fourth quarter because he picked up a little bit of an ankle injury to that point though Johnson had two touchdowns he was dominating the way he is the number one wide receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers and given what we talked about last week coming to fruition when Johnson's on the field Washington and Claypool fall back into this snap count share this weird thing going on there 
you can't play Claypool or James Washington until one of them gets established. And it should be Claypool at some point this season, but until one of them gets established as the lead third receiver, when everyone's healthy, you can't play either one. So you can't play Claypool in this matchup. You just absolutely cannot. Eric Ebron, he's a little bit banged up. He didn't practice yesterday. We, the tone around him is that he's still expected to play this Sunday. And he is the tight end 15. Again, you're looking for streaming options. He's been pretty involved over the past couple of weeks. He's been getting more and more involved in that, within that offense, even with the wide receivers back and healthy. I think he falls into the streaming category if he's good to go as a tight end that you can pick up and play but I'm not going to feel great about it. And it's just going to be a guy within my lineup holding a spot because he gets five to six targets a game at the tight end position. I just got word Miles Garrett missed practice again. So keep your guys' eyes on that because that's going to affect what the rushing game can do for the Raiders. Just in a little quick FYI as that came through uh, our desk now. On the Baltimore side, Lamar Jackson is only our QB nine. Now he could turn things around given his talent, even against a tough matchup in the Pittsburgh Steelers. But the way he has thrown the ball this season, the way they have lacked an identity when calling plays, I think, quite frankly, out of Greg Roman on offense this year in general, I am not going to go in there super confident that Lamar Jackson can give me a top three quarterback performance against this defense. I'm just not. Is he top 10? Do you have to start him if you have him? Yeah, he's a QB one. You have to. No matter who he's playing, because of his God-given ability, he's always going to be able to turn in a good fantasy performance for you. But I expect a low floor in the passing game. Just the pressure I expect Pittsburgh to bring, being that they only really have Marquise Brown to lean on on the perimeter, because I believe Mark Andrews is going to be bottled up quite a bit in this matchup. So I think they're going to have to lean on Marquise, Andrew, uh, Marquise Brown being the one to make the big plays. It just kind of limits the ceiling and the capabilities of what they're going to be able to do. And I don't believe they're going to be able to run the ball effectively in this game either. Mark Ingram didn't practice yesterday. We're still waiting to see what's going on with him. The expectation all along has been that he's going to play, but being that they came out of the bye and he wasn't able to practice on a Wednesday, it does leave me a little bit concerned as far as what he's going to be doing. If he misses, J.K. Dobbins would become an RB3, especially in half-point, full-point PPR leagues, because he would get all the receiving work out of the backfield, at the very least, while him and Gus Edwards split carries. But this is the backfield in general that I'm still going to want to avoid, if I can, against Pittsburgh Steelers, because it's still going to be a low floor. I'm only playing J.K. Dobbins if Mark Ingram is out. If all three are active, I'm not playing anybody. Plain and simple. Marquise Brown comes in as our wide receiver 15. Mark Andrews is still our tight end 10, even though I do worry about him in this one. Because he's such a red zone target for the Ravens and the red zone target, he still has a safe enough floor. And let's be real, he's one of the top talented tight ends in the league. There's no way you're not going to play him if you have him. But we do have, expect a little bit of a lower floor than we normally would. Uh, getting low on time here, I want to switch over here to the... So our first mailbag question we have for you guys is Wyatt. He asked me, Nelson Aguilar or C.D. Lamb? That's where we're at right now when it comes to the Dallas Cowboy offense and the prospect that Ben DiNucci very well might wind up being the starting quarterback. Now, here's what I'm going to say quickly. If Andy Dalton can somehow find a way to be active for this game, and it's not likely, but he has been attending meetings, if he somehow can practice on Friday and get through the concussion protocol, I will lean towards C.D. Lamb because C.D. Lamb is going to have the mismatch against the Philadelphia Eagles because he's not going to see Darius Slay. Amari Cooper is. And we're going to talk about that game more tomorrow. But I would go with C.D. Lamb if Dalton can act. If Dalton doesn't play and it's Ben DiNucci out there, I'm going to stick with Nelson Aguilar, who's been pretty effective and is going to have a mismatch on the other side of the Cleveland Browns offense. And either way, it's not going to be pretty. Either way, you're looking at low-end wide receiver threes at best. But that's the direction I would go. So it comes down to whether Dalton plays or not. Next question, Abby asked me, uh, Josh Allen or Ryan Tannehill? This is just an overreaction to the way Josh Allen has played over the past couple of weeks. I do like Ryan Tannehill against the Cincinnati Bengals. You're playing Josh Allen against the New England Patriots, so he has such a high floor and a bigger ceiling given that they have been giving him all the attempts. Last question we have, Ike, he asked me, 
Rob Gronkowski or Mark Andrews. We actually had, and we're going to talk about that game tomorrow because it's the late window of games. We have Rob Gronkowski as tight end three on the week. So we do have him ranked ahead of Mark Andrews. I'd rather play him against the Giants with no Chris Godwin, no Antonio Brown yet, than play Mark Andrews against the Pittsburgh Steelers if you have the option between the two. Don't drop Mark Andrews, but if you have both of them on the roster, I would actually go with Rob Gronkowski. That's going to wrap it up for the mailbag segment, and that's going to close it out for today's show. Remember, we'll be back at 12 o'clock to one. On the Worldwide Sports Radio Network on your Android app or WWSRN on iOS. Always presented to you also by Belly Up Sports. Make sure you're following us on social media at Belly Up MDFF Show on Twitter and Facebook for those player news update notifications. Put those alerts on. And if you ever want to be on the mailbag segment, just comment, ask us a question, and Check out bellyupfantasysports.com for the latest updated rankings before you head into and set your lineups for previous to your Thursday night matchups tonight. Go ahead and check that out. Everyone stay safe, stay happy, and have a great time watching the Thursday night game tonight. We'll recap it for you guys tomorrow and get you all set for your week eight matchups. Everyone take care.